This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the niche details of modern warfare and underreported conflict with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to writer and researcher Sean Collum. He has been investigating the illicit trade of human organs, specifically when it relates to people trying to flee war and conflict. Just as a warning to anyone listening to this episode, it is very grim. Sean is going to explain to us how this awful business all works. If you like what we're doing at Popular Front, please do consider supporting us at patreon.com slash popular front. Um, I think I think before we get into the the kind of the, the conflict and organ trafficking within war and conflict. Um, maybe just explain what actually organ trafficking is, because it's one of these topics that's kind of often it will be almost like shrouded in a, in a kind of fictional conspiracy kind of thing. But it's a very real issue, right? Maybe just explain to us like what it actually is. Yes. Yeah, so the organ trade is really about buying and selling kidneys. And that's illegal everywhere in the world, apart from Iran, actually, where they have a regulated market. So when people talk about trafficking, generally that kind of conjures up images of people being kidnapped or waking up in a bathtub missing a kidney. Um, But for most of the cases I've come across, people have sold a kidney and agreed to sell a kidney, but because of their um, economic circumstances. And a lot of the people that I spoke to were asylum seekers or refugees or people who had their asylum claims turned down. And for them, selling the kidney was an economic option of last resort. So trafficking does happen and people are physically coerced into selling the kidney in, in some cases. Um, but generally speaking, when we're talking about the organ trade, it's, it's um, the illegal transaction. It's selling the kidney that's illegal. And that for me can be problematic in some cases as well. Because if you've sold a kidney and you're not recognised as a victim of trafficking, for example, you're potentially liable for a criminal offence because it's illegal to sell a kidney. So a lot of the people that I spoke to um, who had kind of precarious legal status because they were asylum seekers or undocumented migrants, um, when they sold their kidneys and reported this to the authorities, um, they were sometimes told that they had actually committed an offence. So even though they were exploited and taken advantage of for their kidneys, they weren't able to get any kind of legal redress or legal assistance. Jesus, that is grim. Um, how did you get into this line of work? Like, what, what was your research? How did you decide, yeah, this is what I'm going to focus on? Well, to be honest, I never was quite sure what I wanted to do. I, I didn't have a plan to become an academic. I, I took two years traveling and I heard stories about the organ trade and organ theft. And I followed it up and I started doing a PhD in Queens and Belfast. And I was, I was coming from it from a legal perspective. So a lot of the work I was doing was looking at how the organ trade fits into the anti-trafficking framework. So I was looking at the laws and the regulations around organ trading, so the buying, the buying and selling of, of kidneys in particular. And I noticed that there wasn't really a lot of empirical work. And what I mean by that, there wasn't a lot of um, engagement with people who were actually involved in the organ trade. And I thought that was problematic. So all these laws were being introduced without any engagement with the people who were actually being affected by this trade and by this type of exploitation. Um, so I saw these reports about different countries. There was a World Health Organization report. It listed a number of countries like China, um, Pakistan and Egypt as being hotspots of organ trafficking. So I wanted to go to one of these countries and get a sense of what was actually taking place. Were people being trafficked for their kidneys or people being forced into selling their kidneys or compelled to sell a kidney um, because of their financial situation? Um, And I wanted to see what the difference was between those different types of exploitation, whether someone was forced into selling the kidney um, through physical coercion directly or whether because of maybe legal pressures or maybe um, because of issues finding work and employment um, or because of war when they were fleeing conflict and perhaps didn't get the assistance they needed in terms of getting resettled to a third country. And this was the only work they could find or the only way they could... um, kind of survive in a difficult environment. Um, I just wanted to get that story. I wanted to understand it from the perspective of people who sold their kidneys, what reasons they actually entered into these agreements. And also I wanted to hear from the brokers as well, if possible. But I wasn't really sure what I was getting into. But for me, it was important to directly engage with people who were involved in this. Right, so a lot of the uh, research you've done has revolved around people basically trying to flee war zones and actually selling their kidneys to, to fund that, how did they even go about doing that? 
Yeah, well, that's one thing I wanted to, to figure out. So when I first went to Cairo, I guess my, my idea was to speak to different NGOs. I, I wasn't sure how exactly I was going to, you know, I couldn't just walk up to someone in the street and say, um, have you heard of the organ trade? Do you know anyone who sold a kidney or have you sold a kidney? So what happened was I was, I was emailing different organizations, different NGOs and asking them about this. I didn't get a lot of responses, but I decided I'd go to Cairo anyway um, to try and see if, you know, if I was there in person, my idea was like, like if you're there in person, people will respond to you in, in, a, in a better way or a more direct manner, at least. Um, and it was important for me to get that human side of the story. So I went and um, when I got there, I asked a lot of questions about the organ trade. Um, I went to different NGOs, but they were more or less telling me what had already been in the news. And a lot of the stories that I had seen in the news were kind of re reproductions um, of stories that had already been there before. So stories about people having kidneys missing in the Sinai, for example, that was referred to quite a lot. Um, and also um, just, just stories that had been repeated over, I don't know, a period of, of 10 years. And these stories, it wasn't quite clear if people were actually being trafficked in so far as they were being forced into selling their kidneys or if this was organ, organ sales. And the law responds to the two different issues in different ways. So it was important for me to kind of understand that gap in information and what kind of implications that would have with regards to the law and then how the law would actually impact on the lives of people who sold their kidneys and who weren't necessarily trafficked or recognised as being trafficked. Um, so I got to Cairo, I asked a lot of questions, I spoke to different NGOs, a lot of people told me that I probably shouldn't be asking questions about this, it was dangerous, and it's not something the Egyptian state really wanted anyone reporting on. Um, but one woman overheard me, and she told me that if I really wanted to understand what the organ trade was, that I needed to speak to the communities who are most affected by this, and this was migrant communities. So she, she um, told me about different street markets around Cairo, and I went to one in particular, Ataba, um, it's, it's in downtown Cairo, and I stayed there for about two or three weeks, and I was just talking to people, and um, I was lucky, it was kind of serendipitous in a way. After a while, I, I developed a, a friendship with one person in particular, and I told him, you know, this, this is why I was here, I was, I was interested in this issue, and did he know anything about it? Um, the first time I asked, he said he didn't really know too much, but after a while, after a few weeks of talking, he introduced me to someone who, who sold a kidney, and it sort of snowballed from there. And for most people, the reason they sold their kidneys was because they, they, they had no way to make money. So a lot of people, like you mentioned earlier, had come from war zones like Ethiopia, Sudan, um, Chad, um, some people from Yemen too. And they'd come to Cairo looking for assistance, generally through the UNHCR. They were looking to claim asylum, to get refugee status, and hoping that perhaps they'd be resettled to a third country where they had a better chance of supporting themselves or their families. But a lot of the time, people go, they register with the UN, their asylum status is turned down, or they have refugee status, but nothing really happens afterwards. They don't really receive any meaningful assistance. Um, and the brokers were, were targeting these people. And they were asking them to sell their kidneys. So, like for example, uh, a broker might maybe target someone who's just arrived in the country from Sudan or from Darfur where there's been conflict and suggest to them that they could sell a kidney and that this would, you know, help them send money home to their families or if they wanted to um, avoid the UNHCR system, because a lot of people are completely disillusioned with that because they register for refugee status, they get that status and um, nothing really happens. And they're in the same situation they were in before, just in a different country. Um, so a lot of brokers were targeting people saying they could give them maybe 5,000, um, 6,000 US dollars. So most of the time they told them they'd pay them in dollars and um, they would save a life. And it was a win-win situation for everyone. But very few people were paid what they were promised. Um, and that was, a, that was a real problem. Some people were, were then um, actually physically coerced into giving up a kidney. So their organs were, were more or less harvested. So what I mean by that is that there was no consent given. For free? They did, they, what do you mean? They, they didn't get paid at all? Yeah, some people. So the majority of people would try and negotiate a price, but there was some of the people I spoke to. So I spoke to over 63 people who had sold a kidney, but not everyone had sold a kidney. And of course, the people who agreed to sell a kidney only did that because it was, it was their last resort, really. They had no other option. Um, and this was about survival for them. And they had families. So a lot of people were under pressure because they had, they had children that they wanted to provide for. Or they had felt guilt, guilty. So, um, you know, recently, I think, well, not that recently, but 2018, 2019, I spoke to a number of young, young men from Eritrea. They had escaped Sawa military camp, had gone through Kassala in, in Sudan, had made their way into Libya, but placed in detention. They eventually got out of detention centers, went back to Sudan, then came through Egypt. Um, 
They didn't want to register with the UN because they didn't believe in it and they felt like they had a better chance of supporting themselves and their families if they could get to, to sorry, not just to Cairo, but to Europe um, by true smuggling routes. So to do that, they were selling kidneys and they were being told by smugglers who had connections with brokers that if they sold their kidney, um, they'd have enough money to pay for the transport and they'd get them across, if not through Libya and um, from the north Egyptian coast. Um, so a lot of these guys were young, but they weren't necessarily paid what they were promised. Some were paid, some were paid um, maybe in Egyptian pound instead of dollars. So instead of getting 6,000 US dollars, they'd get um, 6,000 Egyptian pounds, which is a lot less. Or some people um, in the most extreme circumstances um, were actually trafficked in the most explicit terms. So there was one woman that I spoke to, her, her husband died in, in the conflict in Sudan, in one of the many conflicts in Sudan. And um, she, she was told that she'd get a job as a housekeeper in Cairo and that in time she could perhaps um, get to Europe um, because this particular broker said he had connections with smugglers and he would see what he could do for her. So when she got to Cairo, she was placed in an apartment and told that she'd have to sell her kidneys. And if she didn't sell her own kidney or give up one of her kidneys, um, that they would take a kidney from one of her children because she travelled with two children. So there was some extreme circumstances like that as well. Yeah, that that is unbelievably grim and evil. But how do these these brokers, you know, for want of a better word, these these organ traffickers, the people that come and get the organ, how do they get into it? Like, how do they find? I mean, they'll need a doctor. They're going to need someone to sell it to. How does that network exist? How does it work? Well, actually, it, it's more the doctors need them, need the brokers. So there's a global shortage of organ supplies, and in a lot of countries, not just Egypt. Um, there's a dependency on live donations and a lot of those donations are going to be paid donations. But of course, it's illegal to sell a kidney and any doctor that performs a surgery from a paid donor, for example, um, could be um, in danger of being prosecuted. So a lot, there's just not enough altruistic supply. So there's like in, in, in the UK, for example, you got the NHS, which is a good system. It's not perfect, but a much better system than in most countries. And there's, it's, a, it's a reciprocal system. Um, but in many countries, even where transplants are available through the public health system, it's, it's very limited. Um, so there's huge waiting lists. And the only way to really get a transplant is to pay somebody else. But of course, that's illegal. Um, and a lot of the patients that I spoke to, so I interviewed a lot of patients as well, they would prefer to pay a stranger than to ask a family member. And this kind of culture of organ sales has been normalized over decades. Um, so that's a problem too. So what was happening is... There was a new law introduced in Cairo, in, in, sorry, in, in Egypt in 2010. And that's part of the reason I wanted to go to Egypt. I wanted to look at the impact of that law and how it played out in, in practice or in, in reality. Um, and really what the law did was push the trade further underground. So brokers and intermediaries became more important in terms of recruiting potential donors um, who were being paid, um, but weren't necessarily being promised um, what they were offered. Um, so the brokers, how would they get involved? A lot of the brokers that I spoke to at, at the beginning, they had sold kidneys themselves and they had been recruited into a network of brokers. So they sold a kidney, um, they had some money, maybe 4,000 if they were lucky and were paid what they were promised. That's still not a lot of money and it doesn't really go that far. Some people who sold the kidneys after they sold the kidney, they felt terrible, they started drinking more or they sent money back home. And um, they, after maybe six or seven months, the money was gone and their health wasn't the best because they had one kidney and maybe the surgery wasn't performed in the most sanitary conditions. And um, this was, this was a, a way to make money. So not every broker was, I guess, a necessarily a bad person as such, but because of their circumstances, they were kind of pushed into this business. However, there were some brokers who had established connections with kind of labs where blood testing is done and urine testing is done to match donors with the, um, with the patients. And, and these ones were making more money and they would have a team of scouts that would help them find people, vulnerable people, um, who were maybe open to solicitation and were easier to persuade to sell a kidney. Because you're not going to sell a kidney unless you're really desperate. So they would look for desperate people. Um, Jesus Christ. So how do the doctors do the operation then? I'm imagining there's, you know, it's some kind of black market uh, surgery, of course, but I'm guessing they just do it in their surgery or what? Like, how do they get away with this? How do they do it? It's different. And I've noticed changes over the last six, seven years. So I've been, I've been looking into this issue for a long time and it has changed. Um, so to begin with, a lot of people would agree to sell a kidney for a price. Um, and, and in most cases, the brokers would, 
were, were okay. They would give them what they were promised. Um, but soon they started kind of skimming off the top, offering people money and then changing um, the agreement. And of course, because it's illegal, you can't really complain about what happens. You can't go to a court. There's no dispute resolution or no, no legal dispute resolution. So there wasn't much people could do. And I think it became more violent because... Um, True word of mouth, like the reputations of these brokers just went downhill. Nobody really wanted to work with them anymore. So they started targeting people who had just arrived to Cairo, who weren't normally resident in, in, in Cairo and had no awareness of what the trade was or how it worked. And they target these people instead. Um, but then it's moved on since and they're recruiting people outside of, of Egypt in places, um, in refugee camps as well. So a, a lot of people that I spoke to over the last year had been recruited in Sudan, actually brought directly to Cairo. Um, and a lot of them weren't offered any money at all. So they were physically coerced into giving up a kidney um, with no offer of any kind of payment. Um, so the doctors, yeah, the, the, the surgeries, to begin with, most of them took place in hospitals. Um, some of these were military hospitals, some were public hospitals, some were private hospitals. Then I moved mostly to private hospitals after the transplant law was introduced in 2010, which um, banned organ sales. And then over the last year, I've, I've noticed some of the cases or some of the stories that have been sold from the people that I've, I've, I've spoken to, um, they described private residences. So um, I mentioned, I spoke to some people from Eritrea who, you know, they, these, were, these were young guys. They, they, they told me they were over 18, but, but they look quite young. And they, they'd gone through a terrible time going through. And they, they felt the, the weight of responsibility from their families too, because they're trying to do their best to, to help their families who had spent a lot of money to get them out of the camp, to get them through Sudan into Libya. And then obviously in, in Libya, they, they were detained. Um, and then they went through Egypt looking for better opportunities. And, and not everyone's necessarily looking to just to go to Egypt. A lot of the people I spoke to just wanted to just wanted a better life, just wanted to help the people close to them. Um, and that's why they were being targeted and that's why they were um, open to, to, to selling a kidney. And for them, that, that was a, a major sacrifice. Um, but the doctors don't necessarily ask questions. So how does this get done? It's a, it does a consent form. So a lot of the brokers, they will work with um, different embassies. So in Egypt, since the law was introduced in 2010, it's illegal to do a transplant with a foreign national unless you have approval from your government. And the donor um, and the recipient should be from the same country. But it's easy to falsify that information once you have an affidavit or a consent form and you just sign, the, you sign your signature. And there's not really any real investigating taking place. So there are medical committees that are supposed to investigate this. But once you've got the paperwork, there's not a lot that can happen. And so what I was seeing over the last few years is that in the majority of cases, the brokers would bring um, the donor to um, a lab. And this lab was kind of semi-official. Um, so this is a blood testing lab where they can match the donor with the recipient. And it was at that stage that they would complete the paperwork and they get it signed off by um, the police or by the Ministry of Health um, who, who give overall approval. And then it's sent back to the um, registered doctor who performs the surgery. So by the time basically all the paperwork is completed, on paper at least, everything looks perfectly legitimate. And the doctors, all they have to do is perform the surgery and say that they weren't aware of any kind of criminal conduct or any kind of criminal transaction or illegal transaction, that being a payment. They were surely, they're, they're, they're surely aware, right? They just say, hey, I didn't know, but they knew. Yeah, I'm sure. And like a, a lot of the time from, from the interviews, or and, and I say interviews, they were really conversations. So um, like one of the reasons people spoke to me was I, I'm there for a long time and, and we'd have a conversation that could take place for... I don't know, six hours a day, I'd, I'd, I'd stay for dinner. So like a lot of the people that I, I might, that I interviewed, they were, they were, became kind of friends, you know, and I, I was invested in, the, in their personal stories too. Um, yeah, they, they, I don't know, it, it was, it was difficult. They, they just felt like this is something that they had to do um, to, to, to help their families. And they didn't really know what they were getting into. And that's part of the problem too, because it's illegal. They weren't aware of what was involved. They could look it up on the internet. And a lot of people did that too. They looked up what's involved with donating a kidney. And of course, if it's done under the right conditions, it's fine. But, you know, a lot of people told me that when they had the consent forms, they couldn't even read the form. They weren't sure what they were signing up for. And the doctors, yeah, they, they just don't really look into it. And I can't, I can't speak for every doctor that's involved, um, of course. And, I, I, and it was quite difficult to find any doctor involved, actually. Not one doctor I spoke to would say that, yes, they were performing the surgeries. But, of course, they're aware of what's happening. And with the organ trade, it's different to diff other types of human trafficking. You have to have trained professionals who can perform the surgeries. But on the other hand, a lot of these surgeries, um, 
I don't know if they were performed up to the highest standard. Um, the outcomes weren't particularly great. Um, a, a lot of people who had donated a kidney or had sold a kidney, their, their health status wasn't great afterwards. Um, and, and the scars were, were huge. And I spoke to a transplant professional about this afterwards and said, is this normal for the scars to be so, so large? And he told me that he, perhaps the reason for this was because the doctors weren't trained all that well um, or that they just wanted to get the surgery done as quickly as possible. So they were making larger incisions um, so they could well reach in and, and take the kidney. Fucking um, hell. That is just beyond... And I guess there's no aftercare, right? Because these uh, migrants and refugees, I guess they just, what, they get slinged out after? Yeah, and it's not just migrants and refugees. I, I know it was poor Egyptians too um, as well, but it, it just it turns out that the majority of, well, all of the people I spoke to um, were trying to claim asylum status. And, and, and that's just because of the connections I made when I was in Cairo. Um, but, yeah, they were... I guess the surgery is done. Most people were were turned out almost, you know, within within a day. Just sent home. Yeah, and and I said like a lot of this did take place in in hospitals, private and public. But over the last year too, um, a lot more um, stories were coming back, and a lot more people that I spoke to said or described um, private residences. So th these were maybe apartments that were kitted out with with the with the right medical instruments. Right, like someone's home turned into like a makeshift uh, surgery. Yeah, or perhaps just an apartment rented out for a couple of months to do these surgeries. Wow, that is dark. What kind of money are we talking about here? Like, how much money does the the person that donates generally get? And then how much are the doctors getting? How much are the the middlemen getting? Um, yeah, what money is involved? It depends who you talk to. So. The, the sellers, when I spoke to them, they told me they were getting paid. So they were being offered around 5000 6000 Some people were offered 10000 It kind of depends on what you can negotiate. So people who had normally resided in Cairo and knew what the organ trade was, because the organ trade is an open secret. Um, it was kind of like a form of an in, like an informal economic trade for a long time. It's, it's, it's gotten worse because, um, like I've said, over the last year, I've, I've noticed cases that you can only describe as trafficking. So there are criminal groups involved that are specifically targeting people and coercing them into giving up a kidney. That's, that's different to what was happening before, where people were selling kidneys. They made an agreement. Um, obviously, it was kind of bounded consent. They only agreed to do this because they had no other way to um, survive or to, to generate money. And because they weren't getting the support they're supposed to be getting, um, through the UNHCR, which is really underfunded, and all of the partner organisations are underfunded, um, so they're just not getting any assistance. And and Egypt itself, you know, it's it's it doesn't really have the capacity to deal with the large amounts of of um, people coming through who who need support. And the EU migration controls haven't really helped either, because um, you're, you're probably aware of this too. With you know more border security and this kind of externalisation project coming from the EU perspective, where. Um, EU governments are making agreements with governments like Egypt and um, Sudan and even um, Libya to stop people from claiming asylum in Europe. So that's not helping the situation either because now you have more people kind of bunched up in one area than before, um, just kind of trying to survive with very meagre resources. Um, so that's, that's another reason why people are being pushed into making desperate decisions like selling a kidney. Um, okay, so yeah, people were being offered anything between six and 10,000. Generally speaking, most people didn't get what they were offered. So they would get paid in Egyptian pounds. Um, other people didn't get anything at all. Um, so they were promised, um, yeah, like 6,000. Then when they tried to get that money, um, they were brought to maybe an apartment where they could convalesce, um, so where they could get better after their treatment. And um, they'd ask for the money afterwards. But then the broker who they had spoken to and who was really, really nice to them beforehand would just disappear and they couldn't find them afterwards. So that, that happened quite a lot. Um, the brokers that I spoke to, it depends because there's, there's different kind of types of brokers. So there's recruitment brokers and then there's brokers with uh, connections with the labs and the doctors directly. And they maybe make more money. And then there's people who um, specialize in kind of negotiation or minders who will come with you to the actual clinic to make sure... Um, you don't change your mind and not go through with the surgery. So there is a, there's a, always a level of coercion involved, whether it's implicit or, or direct. Um, so they told me that they, they would only make maybe two or 3,000 themselves um, for every person that they referred to a clinic or everyone that they convinced to um, donate or sell a kidney. And then um, they, they told me that the majority of the money actually went to the hospitals or the doctors. 
And I guess from the hospital's perspective or the doctor's perspective, it's quite easy for them to put down the transplant as a legitimate transplant because, of course, organ transplantation, there's nothing necessarily illegal about that. It's the means that are illegal. So they can say, once they have the paperwork, it can be recorded as, as, um, as a legitimate transplant. But then again, even with the registers, there's not necessarily any registration in place. Um, so it's quite easy to launder the money when it comes to um, organ trafficking. Right, and then once the organ is removed from the victim, if you like, or the person selling it, the doctors have removed it, they've stitched up, they've sent the, the patient away. Then what happens to the kidney? What happens from that process onwards? Where does it get sold to? What kind of people? And how do you go about selling this, this illegal kidney? So it's, it's a live donation. So generally what would happen is... And, like, so we call it transplant tourism, where you have a lot of patients maybe traveling from the UK, for example, the US, Saudi Arabia, depending on where it is, um, to another country to purchase a kidney um, or to get a transplant. So maybe to a private uh, a medical center. So they're not necessarily purchasing the kidney directly from somebody else. That's where the intermediaries get involved, but they're, they're paying for the transplant. So to use an example, let's say you're in the UK, you're on a waiting list for maybe three or four years. Then we have COVID, um, your transplant, which was scheduled, and you've waited for this for four years and you have a terminal illness, has suddenly been cancelled. Um, you know, you might find yourself in a desperate situation. Maybe someone says to you, look, we can get you a transplant in Cairo. They organise your, trans um, your transport, you stay in a hotel, you get your blood tests done, um, you get the transplant. You never meet the donor. Um, the donor comes in, maybe he's from Sudan, um, and maybe he's had his... Um, asylum status turned down and he's in dire straits, needs to make some money. And um, he goes ahead with this. They, generally speaking, the donor and the recipient never meet. And the recipient, for, for, from their perspective, they're trying to survive as well. Um, and the hospitals and the, the brokers, they're making money from this. So then in a sense, they're, they're making money from both the donor and the recipient, the seller and the buyer. So that's generally what, what happens. And I've, I've spoken to some patients before in, in Macedonia who were approached when they were in their dialysis center. So dialysis is difficult. You're going there maybe two or three times um, a, a week, four hours a day, you're hooked up to a machine. Um, and you're, you have no ch chance of getting a transplant in your country. Maybe the country that you're in doesn't even have transplant services available. So you have to travel elsewhere. Um, and then... From what I know, people were being kind of solicited in these dialysis centers. They were being approached by brokers who were offering to take them to another country and to um, sort out transplants for them. Um, so from the perspective of the donor, they're just paying for this service. Or sorry, from the um, perspective of the seller, or, sorry, not the seller, the, the recipient, they're just paying for a service and they're taken to another country, which can be dangerous for them too. Jesus, so the whole thing... Um basically can be made legal by the end of it. Obviously, it's been forged, but it looks that way. Yeah, and, and there's no real investigation taking place because there is a dependency on live donations. Um, I guess from the perspective of, of the medical professionals or the transplant industry, it's, it can't perform these surgeries without, without the kidneys, without the raw materials, and people are being exploited for that. Um, and, and I don't know if the law is really helping there's always a focus on criminalization as the kind of first response, but I think there needs to be more um, attention paid to how demand is being produced. So, you know, what, why is there an increase in organ failure, not just across um, the global north, but also the global south? Like there's, there's a major increase, um, and that's down to issues with food standards and almost is issues with the climate as well. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of reports I've read recently, even in Mexico, for example, where, you know, bad water supplies and crops being sprayed with fertilizers and chemicals um, were causing organ failure. Um, and and that, that's part of the problem, too. Um, and I think, you know, what most people wanted to kind of communicate to me that sold their kidneys wasn't so much the fact that they had a kidney removed. That, obviously, that was dreadful. But why they got into that situation to begin with, that's really, I think, what they wanted to communicate, that they were just trying to find a way to support themselves. And they were kind of, kind of cut, off, cut off from any kind of support. They were completely marginalized um, by the law. And um, this, this is why they were exploited. 
Yeah. Um, you mentioned China at one point. That's kind of the place that everybody thinks of when it comes to organ trafficking. Not really sure why. I think it's maybe partly because you see it in films. It's always like, oh, Chinese organ traffickers. Um, but I've done some research on that before, and they are quite big into it, right? Like China's quite a hot spot for it, as you said. Maybe just talk to us about China. Like, what are they up to there? Yeah, there was a lot of reports coming from China. I, I haven't done any field work in China myself, which is a very difficult place to do field work, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of reports that um, political prisoners um, on death row, their organs were being used for transplants. Um, and and there's, there's actually quite a lot of evidence on that and a lot of reports into it. Um, so that's that's apparently been gone going for years. The Chinese government has come out and said that this has stopped. They they actually did admit that this was happening for a long time, but said it has stopped. But um, I still see reports that this has continued to take place. Um, why why is it just kidneys then? You said you know organ trafficking, but in every circumstance it seems to be kidneys. Why is that? Um, it's not just kidneys. I most of the cases I came across were kidneys, but I guess it depends on how the technology develops. So at the moment. Um, I guess there's there's more transplant surgery available for kidney transplants in particular, but there has been cases of of liver lobes being taken as well. And um, I've I've heard cases too, but I can't document this because I've I've never come across it and I can't prove it as such. But that you know dead bodies, cadavers had different organs removed, including um, hearts and, and lungs. But it depends on what they're being used for. There's there's another trade. It it can be referred to sometimes as the red market, where b different body parts are being sold. They can be used by pharmaceutical companies to produce new drugs, or they can be used for, um, I don't know, for other things, for ritualistic purposes. Jesus, man, what what is being done to combat this organ trafficking? You kind of touched on it at the start. It doesn't sound like you know, surprise, surprise, the UN can really do much. Um, is there anything really being done to try and stop this? Yeah, well, I think we need to look at the bigger picture, too. Like I said, the reasons why people are selling their kidneys, that should probably be the yeah. focus as opposed to trying to eradicate the organ trade, which I think is impossible. Like, as long as people can't find work, as long as people are being marginalised, as long as people are being forced into uh, uh, arrangements with strangers, they're going to get exploited. So there's a number of ways around this. First of all, the, all the focus is, is on supply um, and about increasing altruistic donations, but that's not always realistic depending on the context. Like you can't ask people in a country where transplants aren't available through a reciprocal system to give up their, their kidneys for free. So if you're poor and um, you have no access to transplants because it's only available on a quid pro quo basis, you're not going to donate your kidney for nothing. Um, so I don't think that's realistic. Um, but I think there needs to be more of a focus on public health and on um, actually reducing organ failure and looking at what's causing organ failure and why there's a spike in organ failure. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I think there needs to be more kind of cooperation between states in terms of organ sharing um, to increase, to, to um, maybe start up more of a, a reciprocal system. And I don't think health should never be kind of premised on a profit for profit, profit basis. Um, just, just too much of a focus on privatized health as well. So the health system needs to be reviewed, um, but also, as I said, like v different vulnerable groups. So a lot of the people I spoke to were um, were migrants, were asylum seekers or refugees, and they agreed to sell a kidney because they weren't getting any support. Um, there was no resettlement places. The refugee status didn't really mean a lot. So basically, they would register as refugees. That would mean that they could stay in the country um, if, they, if they needed to, but they couldn't find work. So the conditions in Cairo weren't much better than the conditions in, in Khartoum or in um, Eritrea. In the, well, it was probably better than the military camps, but not a lot better. They couldn't find a way to support themselves, basically. Um, so I, I think there needs to be more international solidarity when it comes to actually resettlement places, too. Um, you know, a, a lot of the time, it's 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 a few countries that are like these agreements. They're just not working. So, like Turkey, Egypt, Libya, even Italy to to a large extent too. They they're being given the kind of burden to um, to deal with all the incoming um, as asylum seekers or people who need help and support. And I think there needs to be more international solidarity. So more countries across Europe and the US need to kind of take in more people. There needs to be a better agreement and it needs to be much more transparent. And a lot of the agreements that are taking place now aren't particularly transparent. Um, so it's fine to say from the perspective of maybe a European government that you know, we're here to support migrants, 
when at the same time a lot of money is going to supporting maybe authoritarian regimes that are in themselves producing more refugees through their own policies. Um, so, so that's a cycle of abuse that needs to be broken down. Right. It's like it's all very well and good to be like, oh, we shouldn't be having uh, illegal organ trafficking from war zones, but at the same time, let's give Saudi Arabia loads of money and let them bomb Yemen. Like, it doesn't really add up. Yeah, this is something I've come to learn. Like, the more I, you know, report on war and conflict, the more it just none of it really makes sense. And a lot of these organizations. You know, personally, I have quite a big problem with the UN because they all, you know, the, the UN is deeply concerned, blah, blah. And then you see what they kind of facilitate across the world. And it's like, yeah, they do a lot of good work. But a lot of the good work they're doing is, is in my opinion, kind of they're doing that work off of stuff that has happened because of them. You know what I mean? It's almost a catch 22 at times. Yeah, I think that's the best way to describe it. Um, everyone's just trying to find a way to help themselves. And like the, the support and funding that's supposed to go into the UN, a lot of the time that funding and that support is kind of couched in development language that we're going to help different countries develop their capacities to deal with these social issues and humanitarian issues. It's been used for border security and a lot of the money that was provided to Libya, for example, that was used for the construction of detention centres and um, some of that money was funneled off to different militias who themselves are involved or can be involved or have been implicated in abuses against um, their own people and migrants and some of those groups could be involved in trafficking too. So you, you ask the question, you know, what's being done about human trafficking? Generally the organ trade is kind of represented as a type of human trafficking. So at the moment, the way the law deals with that, it's, it, it, it kind of looks at the organ trade as a human trafficking offence. But that can be problematic too, because when people sell their kidney, which is illegal, and if they're not recognised as being a victim of trafficking, which is open to interpretation, despite the fact that there is a definition for trafficking, but it's a very open-ended one. Um, so generally, trafficking means that there has to be an action, um, like recruitment through illegal means, um, like deception or the use of fraud for the purpose of exploitation, which could be for sexual exploitation or the removal of organs, for example. Without those kind of three elements, it's difficult to establish a case. And those three elements should be easy to establish, but different different groups, like different law enforcement agencies, um, politicians, and also um, different prosecutors have kind of slightly different working perceptions, understandings of what trafficking is. So generally, it's only the most explicit types of trafficking that will ever make it to a court. Um, and that's only if there's enough reports coming through and if there's enough evidence, which is difficult to collect as well, particularly when we're talking about the organ trade. Now, if you're an illegal migrant and you're in a country and you report this crime, first of all, you might be told by the police that actually what you've done is illegal. You've sold your kidney and you agreed to do that. We don't care that you did so because you're poor or because you need the money. Um, also, where's your, your paperwork? Where's your visa? You know, you, you said you're a refugee, but where's your refugee card? So they could be threatened with deportation as well. So, so that's why, for me, when I was doing my research, um, the group that I saw... Um, where the demographic that I, I saw was most vulnerable to the organ trade and to different types of exploitation as well were um, asylum seekers um, and, and, and like migrants more generally who were denied that kind of legal protection or state protection. Yeah, it's just there's, there's no way for them to have a safety net really, is there, in that situation. Um, Sean, is there anything else you, uh, you want to mention about this before we wrap up the episode? Um, no, I just uh, again, just going back to that point, I think if governments were really serious about helping people, a lot more of the money that was being spent on security budgets would go to actually doing what the UN HCR is supposed to be doing, and that's that's supporting um, people who need assistance. Um, and I think if there was more support, there'd be less cases like this. Yeah, man, I agree. Um, where can people follow your work, uh, whether that be on social media or a website or whatever? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really that social media active. Um, so I've, I've just written a book um, called Trading Life, and, and that's really all about the organ trade, and it's about different illicit networks as well. So I talk a lot in the book about um, criminal synergies and about uh, people smuggling, um, human trafficking, and the organ trade in particular. And it's, it's based mostly in, in Egypt. So it's, it's collecting, it's, it's all the research I've done over the last um, seven years. Sean Collum, Trading Life, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and you'll, you can get that on Amazon or I guess if you just Google it, should come up. So, yeah, it's called Trading Life, Organ Trafficking, Illicit Networks and Exploitation. Amazing. Um, thank you very much, Sean. Really appreciate you speaking to us. That was fascinating. OK, good talking to you, Jake. Cheers, man.
That was writer Sean Collum speaking about the very dark business of human organ trafficking in relation to people trying to escape war zones. Very nasty business, very fucked up, but uh, definitely needs to be spoken about. Go and check his book out. He mentioned it there at the end. Just search Sean Collum. That is spelled C-O-L-U-M-B. Sean Collum, Trading Life. That's his uh, That's his book. Go and have a look. It's on Amazon. I've just ordered it. It looks really good. If you like what we're doing here at Popular Front, as always, please do consider supporting us on the Patreon. That is patreon.com slash popular front. There is plenty of extras for your money there. Uh, Bonus episodes, narrated articles, access to the community discord, uh, merchandise, discounts every time there's a new merch drop. There's loads for your money there. And ask anyone on the Patreon. We work very hard for that. The more we get up on the Patreon, the more money we make there, the more work goes into popular front also you can buy our merchandise at popularfront.shop this episode was sponsored by oracle coffee shop in portland oregon usa they're an independent coffee shop selling only fair trade products see them at 3875 southwest bond avenue 97239 the episode was also sponsored by propagandopolis They're an outlet selling and informing people about historical conflict propaganda. You can get prints at propagandopolis.com. If you use the code popularfront10, you will get 10% off. Uh, This episode isn't sponsored by these lot, but I want to shout them out. Uh, Shout out to the Underworld podcast that's run by two journalists, uh, Danny Gold and Sean Williams. It's basically a podcast that looks at the uh, underworld, you know, crime, uh, organized crime. It's very interesting. They're doing well. Friends of mine, but it's a really good podcast. Check it out. Just search for the Underworld podcast. Uh, If you want to follow Popular Front on social media, Twitter is twitter.com slash popularfrontco, Instagram, instagram.com slash popular.front, YouTube, youtube.com slash popularfront, and you can search for us, I think, on the Reddit there. We've got a Reddit now. It's like r slash popularfronttv. Yeah, that's definitely one. So go and check all of that out. If you want to follow me uh, on all social medias, I am at Jake underscore Hanrahan, H-A-N-R-A-H-A-N. You can check out my work uh, outside of Popular Front at jakehanrahan.com. You'll see all my old docs there, articles, photos, whatever, whatever, whatever. Go and check all of that out. Music in this episode, as always, the intro was by an artist called Home. And the outro is by Sam Black, also known as Son of Old. You can listen to his music at samblackpf.com. The episode was also mixed and mastered by Splicing Block Podcast. Check them out. Very good guys running that. Thank you very much to the higher tier patrons. Without you lot, honestly, this would not be possible. It's been a very hard year due to COVID. You lot are keeping us going. Thank you very much. Uh, Those people are... K Glitter Vulcan, Meredith Waters, Bethany Swoveland, C O'Donnell, Adam H, Ryan Barbadillo, Damian Boyd, Larson 8669, Badnads, Bjorn Kirsten, Diamondstein, Jacob, Michael O'Connor, Zach Packard, Todd Cravens, Will Anderson, Alexander, Nicholas Butter, Ron Swanson, JD, Jav, Ian Froes, James Cully, Michael Akakan, Ethan, Fitz Madrid, Joe Watt, Ed Coulthard, Johnny LaFleur, Clayton Taylor, Hugo Newski, Mike Barone, Liam Williams, Chris Cusimano, Degenerate Zero Alpha, Jojo Arani, DR, Trey Nance, Charlie, Amy R, Rubicon, Frank Austin, Amelia Me, Noah Noahiz, Noahiz, I'm sorry, bro, you're gonna have to remind me outside that. Uh, Christina Rivetti, Freya Northman, Ali Hunter, Moody Al Rashid, Bill Wilson, Andrew Hurley, 
Vida Provost, uh, Brian McLaughlin, Tom Lochrin, Young Wasabi, Sarushe Hawazi, Tony Bin, Adam Berg Snyder, Sebastian, Stephen Davila, Anthony Kabarak, Dan Donham, Fletcher Tate, Chad Walker, Diana Govanek, Cubal, Lawrence Abrahams, Peter McCormick from What Bitcoin Did, Emily Molly, Axel Iverson, Christopher Martin, Ryan Sandercock, Moritz Zumbal and Kate Hardy Roberts. Thank you all very much. Again, if you want to support Popular Front, go to patreon.com slash popular front. If you don't like Patreon, go to popularfront.co slash support. Cheers. Cheers.